We're going to be in Acts this morning, Acts chapter 12, but I'm going to start off, I want to read you a verse in Isaiah to begin with. Isaiah chapter 61 is where I'm going to start off. I'm just going to read one verse there, and then we're going to go to Acts chapter 12. Now, you know, uh, there was that time when Jesus entered into the temple, which was his normal practice on the Sabbath, and he was handed the scriptures, and he opened up, it was the scripture of Isaiah, and he opened it up to this very verse. And he read this verse and a couple more, and he said, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your sight. And I just want to read this first one. In, excuse me. This is in Isaiah ch uh, chapter 61, verse 1. <clears throat> the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. <clears throat> You can flip over to Acts chapter 12 <clears throat> now with me. Acts chapter 12. This is in Acts chapter 12 here. <clears throat> I'm just going to tell you this is where <clears throat> um, Herod saw fit to start condemning and vexing, uh, some persecuting, harassing some of the Christians in the early church. And he, he took James, the brother of John, and had him killed by the sword. <clears throat> Think of this. That's one of the sons of thunder. The inner circle of Jesus Christ, James, the brother of John. Remember, it was James, John, and Peter were always in that three. They were that inner circle that were with Christ in so many uh, just cataclysmic events, just astounding events like the transfiguration and things. But James had been killed by the sword. John has been taken, and, and or no, excuse me, Peter has been taken and thrown into prison. And, uh, you know, he would have killed him right away, but it was, it was the Passover, and he thought, well, I'll wait till after Easter. But he saw this, it was just so sad, he saw that it pleased the Jews that, 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 that he'd killed James. Uh, can you imagine the church being pleased that someone was, was killed? But, but we see here that Peter was taken, <clears throat> excuse me, Peter was taken and put in jail. We're going to start in verse 5 here of chapter 12. Peter's been put in prison, guards have been placed around him, <clears throat> and it says here, Verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came, and a light shined in prison. <clears throat> and a light shined in prison, and he smote. My Mac just go out? Oh, it's still going. Okay, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry about that. And the angel, okay, excuse me, let me back up to seven. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shone in prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto them, Cast thy garments about thee and follow me. <clears throat> and he went out and followed him. And was not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad, but she constantly affirmed that it was even so. And then they said, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. This morning, I want to talk to you about those doors. I, well, Peter, Peter walked out of prison. The doors opened before him. He was led by an angel of God. There sleeping, and suddenly a light shone round about him. Sounds like Tarsus on his way to Damascus, doesn't it? A light shone round about him, and he walks out of that prison cell. I want to tell you this morning, this reminds me of salvation. This story reminds me of salvation. Think about our own selves in this world of sin in which we live. We're stuck in a dark cell at some time. You know, it feels like when you've been saved, it's like you've come into the light. You know, you've come out of this dark jail cell. You've been behind bars, stuck in sin and darkness, and you're awakened by slumber, by the light 
The light of God shines in your heart and you come alive. The Bible calls it quickening, made alive. That, that's you in Christ. You're freed from bondage. You're free from the guards. You're freed from the chains because they just fall away from you and you're led out by the Lord of, of that place where you were of sin and the locked doors just open before you. That's salvation. I want to talk to you this morning about those doors and those doors opening before us and, and how great that is. You know, I think about I think about this. Consider the one that's newly saved. The one that's that's newly saved that that uh, has been bound up in addiction. Let's think of the one that's, that's caught up in, in, in pornography or, or, or alcohol or, or drugs or mean-spiritedness, abuse, gambling, whatever it might be. And then they're saved. And, and, and they're saved. And, and suddenly that stuff just, just falls away, doesn't it? And, and there's somebody that was hooked on drugs can, can get saved on the altar of Jesus Christ, say born again, and they'll walk out. And I've heard this story so many times, and they don't even desire to have it anymore. They have no thought of it going forward anymore because God opened the doors for them. God opened the door. I think about that, that woman with the issue of blood for 12 years and went to all the doctors, wasted all of her money, all of her living. It was none the better, but it was only getting worse. And then one day she, she grabbed hold. She touched the hem of Christ's garment. And suddenly all of that she dealt with for 12 years, it just fell away. That's like salvation, isn't it? Being saved, coming to Christ. He is the answer. Charles Spurgeon told this story, um, I think first is the first one you heard it from. He tells of a tyrant king who ordered this blacksmith to come into his presence, and he ordered him, he ordered this poor blacksmith, he said, I want you to go back and make me a chain. Make me a big old chain. Think of a log chain. Go make this chain for me. So the blacksmith goes back, and he makes the chain to the specifications that had given, been given to him by this tyrant king. He comes back in before the king, and this tyrant looks at it and, and, and just throws it back to him and says, go make it twice as big. So he goes back again and he starts making the chain and he makes it twice as big, just as ordered. He comes back before this tyrant king, hands it to him, and the tyrant king looks at it and says, double it again. Double it again and hurry up about it. So he goes back and he doubles it again. He makes it even bigger. And then he comes back this, this last time with the chain, presents it to the, this tyrant king, and the king looks at it, and then he commands his servants to bind this man hand and foot with the very chain that he had made and to cast him into prison. And that is what the devil does with men, with sin. Sometimes we'll, we, the, the devil will make us forge our own chain. I think one indulgence, one link at a time, We'll, and we'll be bound by the very chain that we made and created ourselves. And then God comes along. And then God comes along and, and, and breaks those chains. He unlocks the doors before you so that you can just walk free of sin. Walk right out of it. That's the salvation I see in this story here. Do you not see that? Or think of that one that's struggling. Struggling with the bad habits. Let's, let's think about the bad habits. Your anger. He was such an angry man. It was all the time. That's the person that's unforgiving. I'll never forgive that person. And then Jesus comes by. We get the touch of faith in our heart. And we get saved. And suddenly I can forgive. Well, forgiveness was never going to be found. The cussing tongue, the cursing tongue. I think about John Newton. You know, the, the one who wrote Amazing Grace, like a wretch like me, he said. You know, if you, there was a story that goes that he was on the slaver ships, you know, and they said he was so foul mouthed that the captain of the ship could, hated his guts and nearly starved him to death one time. He was making up these, these little poems and things that he would sing that were just so foul mouthed and full of language that the captain, sailors are known for a foul tongue. They said the sailors couldn't stand this man, John Newton. And they said he, the, the claim was he could cuss for 30 minutes without saying the same word twice. That, that's really a thing for John Newton. But then Jesus come by. Jesus, he said, never did a curse word pass my lips again as long as I live because of amazing grace, because of salvation in Jesus Christ. Jesus knows the way out, amen. Whatever you're in, whatever's going on in life, 
The desires that you have now, they'll be gone. They can be defeated. I say this before. People go through these programs, the 12 step, whatever it might be. And if Jesus is not in it, they'll come out the other side with more contacts and how to get buy more drugs, do more things. But if Jesus gets a hold of you, he'll break those habits that have bound you, those chains that hold you down. It's because of salvation. I'm going to need somebody to help me preach this morning. I'm feeling good about preaching, feeling good about this message this morning because I love preaching about Jesus and salvation and what he's done for us. <clears throat> this, this one I, I really want to look at here is this verse 10. Verse 10 here, this is the last door that Peter goes out. He's led out by the angel. This last door he comes to is an iron gate opened of its own accord <clears throat> when he comes to it. It opened of its own accord and, and that led out into the city. I see this city, go with me this morning, I see this city as a typology for the world, okay? So think about this. The angel wakes up Peter. It's salvation. It's new birth. It's new life. Wakes him up, and then all, and, and the guards are standing there on either side of him. Leads him, walks him right out past those guards, and, and, and the chains fell off, and, and, and the light shone around him. He walks right out, and the doors are just opening before him, just opening before him. He gets to that last one, the iron gate, and it leads into the city, going out into the world. And he, he walks out into the world, and the angel leads him down one street of the world, right? Leads him down one street, and then forthwith the angel departs thereof. And Peter's left on his own. This is the spot right here where I think a lot of Christians, this is where we mess up. This is where we make the mistakes at. But you know what Peter decides to do? He thinks about it. It's dark. I think it's of a night here the way it sounds. What do I do now? I'm in the world. I'm out here. In the, I've been set free. Here I stand. You know what Peter decides to do? He says, I'm, I'm going to church. <laughs> and so Peter goes to church. He goes down to John Mark's mom's house. There's a house church there. That's where they're praying without ceasing for him. And so he goes on down. There, and, and, and listen, the Holy Spirit guides us. Our own conscience guides us. And, and sometimes, though, we'll, we'll take a wrong turn on that street because as we're heading towards the church, something's going to catch my eye over here, right? Hey, there's something still open. I'm going to go check out what the singing's about. We get messed up sometimes. And you know what will happen is we'll go back to making and forging our chains again if we're not careful. It's like the seed that falls on the rocky soil. It sprang up with gladness, but it couldn't get established or root, and so it, it withers away, and that's the young Christian. But even the old Christian sometimes can turn the wrong way and start making chains again. Can I tell you, here's the good news. This is what God gave to me this week. This is where it all came from. He says, this is the good news. The God that saved us prays for us. Amen. Now, I am, let me show, I can show you this. The God that saves us prays for us. He did not leave us alone. He did not forsake us. We're not out here in the world, in the city streets, on our own. It's maturity that's happened. It's experience. But I, I, I'm witnessing. But listen, the God who saved us intercedes for us. I looked up the word intercede. It means to mediate to make intercession, to act between parties with a view to reconcile those parties who differ or contend with one another. If you're not with God, you're against God. That's what the Bible tells me. You know, to whom you yield yourselves servants to be, those servants you will obey, whether, whether of sin unto death or, or, of, or of obedience unto righteousness, the Bible tells me in Romans. But thank God, thank God that sometimes... I'm just telling you, we're going to mess up. Things happen in life. But thank God that, that the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy, that he cannot hear. Let, let, me, let me read this, and, and this is in Hebrews 7.25. If you want to go to Hebrews 7.25, you can. Mark it in your notes. <clears throat> Hebrews 7.25. The God who saves us prays for us. Oh, it's so good. Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore he is able, talking about Jesus, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The Lord Jesus saved you. The Lord Jesus sitting on the right hand of the Father. You know what he's doing today? He's praying for you. He's advocating for you. He's your mediator. The God that saved you is praying for you. Peter once said, Lord, don't you worry. I'm ready. I I'm ready to go to, I'm ready to go with thee into prison and to death. And Jesus said, Peter, 
He said, you're not going to make it through the morning, and you'll deny me three times. He told him, he said, Simon, Simon. He always said, Simon, Simon, when he wanted to talk about his fleshly side. He always said, Peter, that was the name he'd given him when he wanted to talk about his spiritual side. He said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have thee, to sift thee as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Jesus prays for us. Is that not awesome? That's something to shout about. The God that saved us prays for us. How amazing that is. The good Samaritan not only binds the injuries of the wounded man, but he places him on his own mule, and he takes him to a place of safety where, and he can, where he can continue to be cared for until he comes again. I'm so glad when this old world was through with me, uh, when I had been wounded, when I had been sifted, when I had been broken, and when I was lying without hope in my life that Jesus Christ had compassion on me. His ear was not too heavy that he could not hear my cry and he reached down when I couldn't reach up. Hey, he bound my wounds. Uh, uh, listen to me. He stayed with me. He cared for me. He saved me to the uttermost, by the way, and he didn't leave me. Amen. He, hey, listen, he paid for me. Uh, listen, he never abandoned. He's still praying for me to this day. He still hasn't left me alone. I still hear from him every day. Just like the good Samaritan, he paid for me. And just like he told the innkeeper, the good Samaritan said, I'm going to pay for him until I come back. Jesus is coming back, amen? He's the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He found us like lost sheep, many of us, broken, chewed up by the wolf, amen? And wandering, dying, no water, no sustenance, no hope. Uh, but let me tell you about the good shepherd. As we read earlier, he binds up the brokenhearted. He proclaims liberty to the captive. Uh, he, he opens the prisons to those that are bound. He gives us undeserved beauty for ashes. He gives us the garment of praise. Oil of joy is given to us. He leads us into the good pastures, takes us to the still waters. He restoreth our soul this morning. It is the God who saved us, and he's the God who's with us, and he's the God who prays for us and intercedes for us. I don't deserve a God like that. But that's the God we have. The God that saved you prays for you today. Amen. Peter chose to go to church. Peter chose to go to church. He made the right choice there. But he, he comes to this church. He knocks on the door. And here comes this young girl, Rhoda, to the door. Rhoda comes to the door, looks at it, and in my mind's eye, she sees him, and she, they've, been, they've been in there praying all night ceaseless, ceaselessly for Peter. And she comes to the door in the middle of the night, somebody's knocking, here comes probably 13, 14 year old little Rhoda. She looks at the door and she's like, It's Peter! And I can just see her running around going, It's Peter! It's Peter! It's Peter! But she forgets to open the door. You ever come to a locked door? You ever come to a house and you know their home and you knock? but they will not answer the door. You know they're home. Try being a preacher. <laughs> Try being a preacher during COVID. <clears throat> and uh, it happens a lot, let me tell you. A lot. <clears throat> Rhoda runs off saying, it's Peter, it's Peter. The church had been praying ceaselessly for Peter. She gets back inside and they say, no, it's not. Rhoda, sit down. And she's like, it's Peter, I'm telling you, it's Peter. And she says, it's, maybe, it's probably his ghost, whatever she won't. They won't believe her. And they're in there on the knee praying ceaselessly for Peter to be set free from prison. He's at the locked door at the church outside and, and nobody's opening the door. Think about that story about the, the town that had the drought. You, you've probably you've heard the story, I'm sure, but the town had the drought real bad. And, and so all the people after so long, they, they decide to go down and gather at the, at, at the church and they're going to fast and pray that God would send rain and, and the way the story goes, one little boy showed up with an umbrella. Only one little boy showed up with an umbrella. That's, that's the prayers that we should seek for. That's the prayers I'm seeking for. <clears throat> from the prison, from the prison to right here at the church, do you realize every door had opened for Peter? Every door had just been unlocked, swung open wide for him. And he comes to the church, and that's the one that's locked. You ever felt like, you ever felt locked out of church before? It's really bad. Let me tell you something. When you get hurt by church folk, ain't nothing worse. It's hard. You know why? Because we're family. 
We're brothers and sisters in Christ, and you get hurt by church folk. It's like being stabbed with a poison knife, not just a knife. It hurts. It burns. It's bad. You've been burned by a hypocrite in church. You've been gossiped about. Preacher ever fail you? That's going to happen. Preachers are human. <clears throat> you ever go into that fellowship hall meeting, and when you walk in, you don't know that many people, and everybody's in their little groups, and it feels like you're in, back in middle school again, walking into the cafeteria, and you don't know anybody, and where am I going to sit? All the tables are full. It hurts when it's church, doesn't it? It hurts worse, doubly, when it's church. So here's my advice. <clears throat> here's my advice today. I didn't even flip over to that next one, did I? Do like Peter did. Amen. Keep knocking. He, he came to that door. It's locked. He can't get in. Rhoda's ran off a screaming. And the Bible says, I think it's in verse 16 right here, he says, he keep, Peter keeps knocking. That's my advice to you today. Keep knocking. If you found a door spiritually that just won't open, you know, keep knocking. Don't give up. Maybe, maybe it's not the church's fault at all. Maybe that door that's locked before you is because of your own failings. Maybe you've backslid, you burned out, you lost your joy, you feel unworthy in the church anymore because of sin in your life. Maybe, maybe you're embarrassed, you had a DUI, you lost your job, been through a divorce, you don't think you got good enough clothes. Hey, Peter's wearing an orange jumpsuit robe with, with the Department of Justice written on the back of it and government sandals, and he still goes to church. Don't worry about your clothes, but because my advice to you is to keep knocking. You just keep knocking. You just keep knocking. My ladies over here clapping their hands. Sometimes they feel discouraged because nobody else will clap with them. You know what I told them to do? Keep clapping. Keep clapping. Someday somebody's going to say, that's good. good. Some of are doing it too. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's good preaching right there. I like Joe Tolbert on it. <laughs> Hey, maybe, maybe you got tired of singing hymns. I'm ready for some praise and worship. I, I'm tired of singing hymns. I got tired of going to Sunday school. I'm bored with the sermons. I'm too busy for Wednesday nights, and now you have found yourself outside the door feeling unconnected. Uh, you, you're questioning your purpose in life. You're, per, you're questioning your faith. You have doubts. You need to keep knocking. You just, you just keep knocking. Don't give up on church. Don't give in to weakness. That old seeking lion, can I tell you what that old seeking lion's doing? He's out there roaring. He's out there circling. He's out there growling. He's out there prowling. And he is waiting for you to separate yourself from the flock of God. That's what he's waiting on, to see weakness. And when he sees it, that's when he's going to pounce. Amen? If an old sinful desire, a temptation has gotten a hold of you, if it's rearing its ugly head to you again, that old sinful desire is rearing up its ugly head, can I tell you that Jesus doesn't stomp the head of that serpent? Get Let go of it. Get away from it. You don't have to worry about it no more. Just keep knocking, hey? Just keep knocking this morning. If you've ever run into a locked door in your spiritual walk, if you hit a door that just won't open, <clears throat> You know, maybe you've seen God open those doors before. You've seen God move in your life. You've experienced his grace. You saw his power moving in the church and in your own life. But you have somehow become disingenuous to corporate worship now, whatever that means. Can I tell you this? Keep knocking. Don't let your heart become hardened, as the Bible refers to it so often. Don't give up on God. He'll give you the key if you keep knocking. You just got to keep knocking. Maybe you realize your faith wasn't really what you thought it used to be. Maybe in the last year or so you started to question. You feel defeated. You feel adrift, disconnected, and, and, and unsure about your faith anymore. Where am I at today, Lord? Keep knocking. Keep reading your Bible. Keep praying. Don't forget that Jesus left heaven on a rescue mission. Amen? If you're exhausted and standing this morning and you're tired of being the one holding up your hands and you feel like you're the only one holding up your hands anymore, can I tell you this morning, you just hang in there. You just keep knocking because Aaron and her are on their way. Amen. He'll help you if you just keep knocking. Keep knocking this morning. Don't give up on God. If you're ready to give up, if you're ready to run the other way, you'll let the devil win. Don't let the devil defeat you. Keep knocking. Keep your head up. Keep your arms high up. Keep the banner flying. Amen. Help is on the way. Keep knocking. <clears throat> Let me tell you, maybe that locked door that you've come up against is your failing health. Maybe it's chronic pain. <clears throat> maybe it's someone in your family's pain. Maybe you've lost someone. How could a good God do this? How could a good God do this to me? 
I'll tell you, like Job said and like the psalmist said, Job said in the end of the book, he said, I thought, I only thought I knew you, but now I know that I knewest thou not. I knewest not things too wonderful for me to grasp, O oh God. The psalmist said, I knew nothing, but the psalmist said, your thoughts, Lord, are higher than my thoughts. Your ways are higher than my ways. Listen, his reasons are just, but some of those reasons we may not discover this side of glory. We will one day find out the why. But listen, we know that we live in a fallen and a broken world, but God is good. And even though I don't understand the secret ways of God, I know this. I can trust him. I can trust in his promises. I can learn from his revealed promises. Because listen, when I am weak and when I'm faltering, when I'm hurting, when I'm confused, he is strong in me. We will understand one day, but until then, keep knocking. Stay faithful. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, Jesus said. He gives wisdom willingly and abradeth not to those that ask. Ask him what's going on. Keep knocking. Trust him. Keep searching. Amen this morning. Okay, let's look at this in reverse for a minute. How about if we, we let's put ourselves on the other side of the door. Let's put ourselves on the other side of that door. I tell you this morning, the church needs to be alert and needs to be attentive and listening for the knock of those desiring to come in. I I worked for UPS for about six years or so, and they taught us there. I I was taught this very early. They said, when you come to the door, when you need a signature, you knock on the door. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, no, no, no. Listen, we're, we got we're on it. We got to get going because you're. We got to get these packages out. When you come to the door, you you bang on that door. You knock on that door. Let them know you're here. I've tried to train my kids that. My kids come up. I'm like, what? The, the dog didn't even hear you in there. You got to knock like you mean it, you know. But listen to you. Not everybody's going to do that. Not everybody's going to knock like that on that door. You understand? Did you know that we got to be attentive and, and watchful because. Sometimes they may look just like us. Sometimes they may look like they've got it all together. And their world's falling apart on time. But if you're attuned with Christ, attuned with the Holy Spirit of God, God will reveal things to you, and we got to be watchful. We need to keep our eyes to the door, watch who's coming in. People, can I tell you this? People are searching for answers today. People you would never suspect. I'm telling you, they're looking. And can I let me go on this high horse this morning? I'm telling you, it doesn't matter. It does not matter if it's a bedraggled bum, an outcast that's been torn by the wolf, poor, a spit out homeless drug addict that walks through that back door. If they're seeking the precious balm of Gilead and healing in this place, then we need to receive them. I don't want to be like the Pharisee uh, who said to himself when Jesus let that woman come in and wash his feet. He said if he was a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman this is. He, he would know that she's a sinner. Uh, that other Pharisee Jesus talked about it said, thank God I'm not like this publican. Amen. We, listen, let us never be so self-righteous that we look down on one of God's lost sheep thinking that we're better than them. Uh, you're better than them because of Jesus is the only reason. You might be from High Dollar Hills. And listen, you might have lived in a marble tower. And, and she's from the wrong side of the tracks. But beneath the cross, the ground is level. Can I tell you that this morning? And on that great judgment day, uh, the, the only birthright, the only gift certificate that's going to matter to God is not your earthly one. God doesn't care if it's etched in gold if the President of the United States has signed it. The only thing that will matter for you to gain the boundless glories of heaven will be that you're saved and you're born again and that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus is the propitiation. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, the Bible says, but for the sins of the entire world. In 1 John 2, 2, it says that. For the whole world, every soul is precious. Every soul is valuable, immensely valuable. We need to get that through our heads today. Immensely. That that vagabond laying on the side of the street. uh, Let me say there's value in him. He just doesn't realize because he's got the chains of Satan binding him to that place. Uh, You know what he needs to see? He needs to see the light of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what he needs. Listen to me. Here's where where it comes from. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gained the whole world but loses his own soul? You know what he's saying there? Your one soul is worth more than ever. Everything and all the riches in the entire world. Every soul is worth more than everything in this world to Jesus. You have value. 
I've told this story before, and probably so many times you're tired of hearing it, but I gotta tell it again because it just fits here. And that's, uh, and there's some new people don't know this, but when, when we were getting ready to move over here, I've told you this, it was the last week, like we're packing up. We had boxes ready, the, the trucks ordered, were, you know, you guys were coming to help us move to Thayer, and that, here come that little cat to our house, uh, and it was a kitten, and Brindley saw it, and here comes Brindley with this, this cat, and, I, and I'm going to be in trouble for this later, but I just got to be honest with you, everybody says all kittens are cute, but this one really, it wasn't, it wasn't that cute, I'm just sorry, see she's already glaring at me back there. <laughs> So I told Brindley, no, we are not taking a cat to Thayer. And had I known how many cats were in Thayer, I really would have said no. <laughs> Good Lord. <clears throat> but, I, but see, she's, to her, can I tell you this? In, in her eyes, when that cat kitten showed up, it, it, see, it ran to her. <sighs> when that little cat ran to Brindley, you see, in her eyes, it was already hers. Because she saw this cat as a treasure. She saw this cat as it was beautiful, it was lost, it was needing nourishment, it was needing love, and it was needing a forever home. And it was daddy's little girl asking. So I'm telling you, you guys out there that don't have daughters, you don't realize that little girls, they're, they're given, see they inherit things from their mothers that they can use against their fathers, <laughs> I think is what it is. But uh, yeah, we have, we have a cat now. <clears throat> yeah. But you know, we should be looking outside the church in the same way and looking for those people just like, just like Brindley did. Because that's how Christ sees them. That's how Christ saw me. I tell you this morning, even when I was a black-hearted, hell-bound, fouled by this world sinner, Jesus looked down from a blood-soaked cross. And when he saw me, he saw me not as I was, but he saw treasure, lost, needing nourishment and love and a forever home. We cannot, should not ever refuse those that have come seeking God in his place and his house. You know why? Because there's still room at the table. The Lord said unto the servant, you know, the Pharisees, those that were better than everybody else, they refused the invitation to come. And the Lord said, go out into the highways and the hedges. You know what's in the highways and the hedges? Out there on the highways and the hedges is the riffraff. That's where the poor people are at. That's where the men with alcohol still on their breath are at. He said, you go out into the highways and the hedges and you compel them to come in that my house might be filled. Amen. There's still room at the table and there's still room at the table at Thayer Free World Baptist for those that want to come. Amen. Amen. Praise God this morning. We need to welcome everyone into our fellowship. If you hear someone knocking and no one's listening, be a Rhoda. Be a Rhoda. Go get the people of God. Go get the people. You know what it might be? It might be angels knocking and the church might be unawares. <clears throat> what if it's Jesus knocking? What if it's Jesus knocking? I, I, we look here in Revelation 3 where he's talking to the church of Laodicea. Jesus in this verse, remember this, he's talking to a church when he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. That's relationship. But Jesus talking to the church when he says that, you understand. We, we need to be careful. The Lord has called us as his church to open the door, to not pass judgment. Amen. Amen. Peter was set free from that jail cell. He was set free from there as, uh, uh, just as we were uh, set free spiritually. And, and, and Peter just went about to proclaim the gospel. He was set free. We were set free from our bondage. Peter went out to proclaim the freedom found in salvation. Let us also proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison door to those that are bound. That's our job. That's our, that's our sacrifice as well. Amen. I just got a little more. Jenny, you want to play a song for me? Let me have a little postscript here. Postscript. Talking about... After the fact, after the fact, the next day, the Bible goes on to tell us a little bit about this. It's been about 12 hours probably since this has all happened. There was, the Bible says there was no small stir among the guards at what had happened to Peter. He's gone. Nobody knows why. Nobody knows how. 
There was no small store among the stir among the soldiers. And here comes King Herod. And he investigates the matter. And at the end of that, you know what he decides? Kill them all. You soldiers did not do your job. And he says they're to be executed. I have no doubt, no doubt in reading the book of Acts and knowing Peter, I guarantee you he witnessed to those guards. Guarantee you he witnessed to those guards and told them about the truth in Jesus Christ and how they too could be free from bondage. And he told them, I guarantee it. Assuredly he had done so. You know, 150,000 people a day die. <clears throat> they did not realize that when Peter was telling them about how they could pass from death into life and how they could know Jesus and all this, he, they didn't realize that in about 12 hours, their life would be taken from them. He, he told them about Jesus. I know he did. So there was a, there was a, a lady one time that <clears throat> come to the governor and she said, Governor, I come to speak to you on behalf of my poor son. She said, he's, in, he's down at the prison house and, and he's set to be executed by the electric chair. And I'm not coming to you asking for justice, sir. I'm coming to you to ask for mercy. He's my only son and he's my support. If there's anything you can do for him, would you, would you do it for me? Do it for me? And the governor was a good man and, the, and so the governor said, I'll check into it. And a couple days later, after he checked into the, the matter, he went down to the prison. And as he was walking down the hall, approaching that green mile, heading toward the, the prison cell, <clears throat> this woman's son saw him coming. And what he saw was a suit coming at him. And he said, there's another preacher. There's another preacher coming. And he said, hey, turn around, don't bother. I don't need you get out of here. I don't want you here. And the governor said, sir, I might have something you want to hear. I got something pretty important to talk to you about. You might want to hear what I got to say. He said, I'm tired of hearing. I don't want to hear you. Get out of here. And he cursed him and cussed him until he left. After he had left, the warden come down and said, hey, what did the governor have to say? Did you guys get along well? Do you have any good news for you? And that young man fell to his knees on that concrete floor. And he said, oh, God, have I insulted the only man that could have saved my life? And that is exactly what he had done. And that is exactly what everyone is doing who rejects the Lord Jesus Christ today. <clears throat> Would you stand with me this morning? I wonder this morning, what if you were like one of those guards? What if you were like one of those guards Somebody standing here today telling you that this could be it and that you can know you can be set free from the bondage that you're in. Those chains can be eliminated. What if he's coming back today? What if is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? It's the most important question that you have to answer today. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Do you know that? Are you sure of that today? I pray that you're sure. Have you rejected Jesus? Listen to me. The doors have been opened for you by the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what you got to do? Just walk through them. That's, he's already done the work of opening the doors. He's unlocked those chains well, from the work he did on the cross of Calvary. All you got to do is walk in. You know what Jesus said one time? Jesus said one time, I am the door. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. That's the words of Christ this morning. If the Lord is knocking on your door, I pray this morning, knocking on the door to your heart, would you let him in? Would you let him in? Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Can I tell you this? Let me remind you of this. Whatever you think of yourself, whatever you've went through, whatever's happening, when Jesus looks at you this morning, he sees you as a treasure. You're lost. You need nourishment and you need tender love and he sees you as someone who needs a true friend and a forever home. Will you submit your life to Christ Jesus? If you will, he will take you home with him. Do you, he will take you home to dine with him. He will sup with you forever. Do you hear the knocking this morning? He hears you. He hears you. Can we sing a song this morning with us? Can we sing? Oh, would you pray? Would you pray?
I'm preaching a message of no more importance than what's happening right now in this place. This is the invitation of Christ Jesus. No matter where you're at in your life, if you don't know him, I ask that you come. If you are burdened down with chains, would you come? If you want freedom, the only freedom that can ever be found in Christ Jesus, would you come this morning? If you've gotten away from him in any way, would you come? He hears you, he hears you. If the devil has you building a chain again, think about those besetting sins. Let me talk to you, let me get real serious with you. Don't look around. Don't look around and think about somebody else. I want you to think about this. You got a besetting sin. Can you stop looking at those images online? Can you not leave the brown bottle alone? You can't stop the lying. Why do you have to embellish everything you say? Your anger, your absence, your tongue this morning, your tongue. You're flirting your self-hate. You're feeling worthless. Your impulses, your anxiety. Would you come this morning and give that to the Lord? Those are chains that are holding you down and holding you back from the power of God in your life, for the feeling of forgiveness, for the release of guilt. Would you come this morning? It's time to break those chains, and the only person that can do this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you come? Would you come this morning? Won't you come this morning? Let me reintroduce you to the chain breaker. Would you come this morning? In the name of Jesus, in the power of Jesus' name, would you come this morning? Oh, Lord, help us. Lord, help us, those listening online, if any of this affects you. If this is you, I pray you bow right there where you're at right now. Let's be done with this. The Lord could return today. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Lord, take these besetting sins from me. I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired of dragging this chain and this ball around with me everywhere I go. I'm tired of feeling like this in church. Lord, take this guilt from me. Lord, break this chain from me. Jesus, in Jesus' name, I'm done with this. Lord, help me, Father. Help me through the power of Christ. Would you help me? Help us, Lord, this morning. Keep knocking. Keep knocking this morning. Keep knocking. Oh, would you come? Would you come? Would you come home? Come back home. Come back home this morning. He'll answer that door if you'll come back home this morning. Oh, like the prodigal. I'm coming home, Lord. Oh, Lord. He's waiting on the porch. He'll see you approaching. No matter what you're wearing, what you look like, would you come this morning? Lord, I'm coming home. Oh, Lord, bring us home, Father, this morning. Bless this congregation. Holy Spirit, move in this place. Ignite our hearts. Convict us, Father. Let us be free of sin. Let us relish and live in the joy of gladness. It can only be found in your spirit, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, Lord, this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Preacher, I've not been listening nor watching for that one at the door. Ask Jesus to give you ears to hear, attuned to be ready to witness for the gospel, to be a blessing to the stranger. Lord, let Thayer Free Will Baptists always have room at the table. Father, help us, Jesus, with a judgmental spirit. If that would, don't ever let that enter into this place. God, I pray you destroy it at the door. Banish it from this place, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Help us, Lord. Oh, Lord, grow us in faith. Grow us in love. Grow us in maturity of Scripture. Father, help us, Jesus. Convict us, Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.